Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. First of all, let me thank all of you for coming out this evening uh, to the first of three uh, legislative listening sessions hosted by the county executive. Uh, let me start out by saying the county executive should be here shortly. Uh, he was in a meeting that got that ran a little bit later, um, so he should be here. I just uh, spoke with him and he's en route, so he should be here in a very few minutes. Um, but we wanted to just go ahead and start get started. We appreciate your patience. Uh, one of the reasons why we did have the uh, folks from the different agencies here for you to talk to uh, is just in case we had a situation like tonight. Um, and I'm glad we planned for it. Uh, but with that in mind, um, I hope you had a chance to visit the tables out there. Um, some of the agencies will be here uh, for the remainder of the night. The idea behind the setup of the tables was to have you a, give you a chance to actually engage with the government and ask questions directly to the agencies uh, where you may have a question, uh, concern, or comment. Tonight uh, is about you all. Uh, typically, you go to forums or sessions uh, where your elected officials are speaking directly to you, telling you uh, what they plan to do. Tonight is your opportunity uh, to provide us uh, with information uh, that our representatives can take back to Annapolis uh, in terms of legislation or ideas. So with every question, there might be legislation in it. With every concern, there might be a, leg a legislative action in it. So we definitely want to hear from you tonight. Uh, currently, we have about 15 speakers who have signed up to speak tonight. Uh, each individual will get three minutes to speak. Uh, Courtney Glass here uh, will have a sign. The sign, do you have it with you, Courtney? Uh, we, have a, we have a timer, which will buzz. Uh, but once we get to the one minute mark, Courtney has a sign that she's going to get that's nice and pink that will alert you that you have one minute to go. Um, obviously, all the issues that everyone is going to bring to us tonight are going to be important to you. Um, but we also ask that you try to make sure that you stay within the time constraints so that you can be respectful of, your, uh, of the other residents who might have a concern. Um, and we will be here until we get through the list. So we're not going to rush out. We're going to hear each of you uh, out uh, until, we get your, until you get your uh, questions out to us. Um, in terms of, of the structure of tonight, um, the county executive, once he gets here, will make a few remarks. But we'll also give uh, our elected officials who are sitting in front of you a chance to, to say a few words as well. Um, we're joined tonight by the delegation chair, chairs of both the House and Senate of, of the Mar uh, in Maryland. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce uh, House Delegation Chair Jolene Ivey. And Senate Delegation Chair Doug Peters. I believe we also have uh, with us a few other elected officials. Uh, I believe I see uh, Council Member Eric Olson in the back. Give him a round of applause, please. I think I also see Delegate Ann Healy there in the back. Give her a round of applause. Uh, Mount Rainier City Council Member uh, Jimmy Tarlow. I think I see him there. Give him a round of applause. Who's that? Um, yeah, and the uh, Mayor Pro Tem of the town of Berwyn Heights, uh, Jody Koopa Edie. Is that correct? Did I say it right? That's the first that I get something like that right. I think you were here last year when we were in, in Greenbelt, if I remember. Um, and uh, let's see, we also want to make sure that you know, and the county executive would say it if he was here, um, he wants to always make sure when we have these events that the government that serves you is present. So we have, a, we have quite a few uh, of our high-ranking uh, government officials. I'll start with our uh, chief administrative officer, Mr. Nicholas Majet. Uh, also, our Deputy Chief Administrative Officer for Public Safety, uh, Mr. Barry Stanton. 
Thank you somewhere in the back there. Um, also, our Deputy Chief Administrative Officer for uh, Finance and Administration, Mr. Thomas Himmler, is in the back. Um, I don't believe we have any more uh, of our, uh, oh, I'm sorry. And we also have our, our newly minted uh, Deputy Chief Administrative Officer for Economic De Development and Public Infrastructure, Mr. Vis Victor Hoskins. And we have a number of agency heads uh, who are here from the, ver the various agencies around the government. So if you're sitting, please stand and raise your hand. And if you're standing in the back, uh, raise your hand. So as you can see, if you turn around, uh, we have the full breadth of the government here um, to serve you. I think we also have uh, a, a few Central Committee members, Democratic Central Committee members here. Uh, and if they could please stand. And if they're standing, just raise, wave your hands, please. Um, so, as you can see, the government is here, and, and again, we're here to listen to you so we can make sure that we serve you appropriately. Uh, the county executive just arrived, but I think I'm going to go ahead and uh, start with uh, Delegate Ivy, if you could give us a couple words of welcome. Thank you so much. Thanks, all of you, for coming out tonight and really taking part in democracy. I think it's a wonderful thing. Uh, we have a few people among us who have taken part in democracy in a different way this year, and there are Democratic nominees who will be on the ballot in November. Uh, and we have uh, Denny Taveras, who is, will be our council member. Danielle Glaros. Where are you, Daniel? There you are. <laughs> Diana Fennell will be a delegate. And Jimmy Tarlow, who was um, introduced earlier from Mount Rainier Council, will be a delegate. So I think that's great. And on December the 16th in the evening at Sports and Learning Center, I hope that you'll all come out again for the local bill hearings. It'll be a time when you'll have the opportunity to hear what everybody thinks, and you can sign up and tell everybody what you think about legislation that will be considered in Annapolis, that state legislation that only affects Prince George's County. And I hope you'll come for that. And welcome. I'm glad you could come join us. Glad to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Douglas, did you speak already? No, it's his turn. Senator Peters, would you like to say a few words? Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Uh, the county executive has arrived. <laughs> He's in the building. <laughs> uh, this is my sixth year as the Senate delegation chair. I represent the eight senators from uh, Prince George's County. And uh, I would encourage you, as Delegate Ivy said, to come down to the local bill hearings. We have no idea sometimes what's going to happen during the session. When you go to local bill hearings, all of a sudden you get a real feel for the direction people are going. And you can come in and, and give input and actually help amend some of the leg legislation, support it, or even kill it if you don't like it. So I would encourage you to come out for the, uh, for the local bill delegation hearing. Thanks for holding this, and thanks for having us tonight. Mr. County Executive, it's all yours. Oh, there you go. I'm on. And I'm sure Barry will give me directions as to what I'm, I'm going to do since I just arrived. I don't know if uh, Council Member Eric Olson uh, said anything or just acknowledged that he's here. Eric Olson's in the back. Can we give him a round of applause? <laughs> Doing a great job. And with that, we're, we're going to get started, or should I say some opening remarks. First of all, how's everyone doing? Thank you for coming out this evening. I should probably talk about why we're doing this. This is um, new for the county executive office. Um, one of the things that we wanted to do as a team, and, and I've been so lucky over these last uh, almost three years to, to, have, to work with some great individuals, um, the last uh, year 
uh, with two years with Jolene as the chair of the House delegation where she's done uh, a marvelous job. And as she exit the House, I want to publicly thank her for uh, leading the efforts on um, education uh, in the county. We would not be as far, whether you agree with the legislation or not, um, we would not be as far as we are in improving our school system had it not been for her uh, leadership and willing to take on tough issues. Um, same thing with the hospital. You know, funding for a brand new regional health care facility uh, would not have taken place if we did not have the help of uh, Delegate Ivey and Chairman Ivey. And I told her this, and I meant it. I think she will go down as, you know, the best chairman ever of the House delegation. And as a former chairman, that means I think she did a better job than I did, Brian Moe. Can we give her a round of applause for a great job in public service? And, and certainly, Senator Peters has been a great partner to work with. Um, I haven't asked for anything difficult in Annapolis, um, have I? Never. That's not, that's not, <laughs> that's not my style. Um, but, but one of the things I wanted to do that was helpful when I was the chair, and, and, and Director Moe will remember this, is that we started uh, public hearings all around the county. We decided before we went into Annapolis, we wanted to hear from citizens and residents uh, about what's going on. And, um, and, and it was a great you know, opportunity for us to actually help craft what it is we wanted to see happen. Um, and so as county executive, one of the things that I wanted to do was actually have this listening session where we get to hear from you. Um, but also, we put a different twist. You know, I found there are a couple of things you could do for county as county executive. Not really a lot, you know. But there are a couple of things you can do. It's, it's amazing if you ask directors of departments to show up, they actually show up. I mean, that was an I didn't realize that could happen, you know, but it does. So they actually show up here. And guess what? When they show up here, you can ask them questions. Or when you ask me questions, I could actually point them out. Right, Chief Fisher? And they'll actually answer those questions that people have. And we can actually solve some of the problems here in real time. So um, it, it, it's a great opportunity for us to, to, to come out and meet you and, um, and to hear from you. With that, we will start the hearing. So a couple of rules of the road. Um, the first thing I will do is we'll call the name, and um, I will also call the name of the person, which I'll say is on deck, which means that you'll be ready. So you can either get up uh, and stand behind the person who's speaking, or you will just know that you're the next name on the list. Um, before I get started, too, I just want to remind you that, again, this is the first of three of these. Uh, the next one uh, will be in South County, uh, and that will be on October 3rd at Oxon Hill High School. Um, the third one and final one, which will be held uh, in Central County, will be held on October 16th, uh, and that one will be at uh, Herbert Flowers High School. So mark your calendars if you have a particular issue that you want to remind us of three times. Uh, we welcome you to come to each of those sessions if you so choose uh, to, to make your voice heard. That, that should be October 9th. I'm sorry. I, I, did, I thought I did October 9th first. Okay. I'm sorry. October 9th is the one. Oh, the dates are. Okay. Sorry. So we switch that. It's the 16th at Oxon Hill and the 9th. Am I wrong? No. It's. Frowson. Okay. The 9th is at Oxon Hill right. High School. Yes. And the 16th is at Flowers High School. Okay. Everybody. Yeah, I thought that's what I said, but yeah, okay. Anyhow, <laughs> this is how my let's get started. Really runs. So our first speaker for the night is Laverna Williams, and on deck is Rita Butler. Okay, sure. We're Hold gonna on. bring you a mic, Laverna. How are you doing? I, I signed up to ask questions after uh, the other speakers, not to speak myself, other than um, 
most of my, the most, the, the most important thing I was here for, one of the most, was concerning code violations, but those questions have been answered. Uh, Were they answered tonight? Uh, yes. Terrific. Um, can I ask who answered the questions for you? Uh, Gary Cunningham. Gary Cunningham was one, and a couple of the ladies at the table. We uh, discussed the problems that we're having in Lewisdale and some of the things that we can do to um, solve them. And one uh, large problem we're having at the moment, uh, Mr. Cunningham's going to look into it for us. Very good. See, we have made progress. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good job, Gary, and your team. Before Ms. Before Ms. Butler speaks, um, Joel Ryerson is on deck. Well, okay. All right, I just had a couple of concerns. Again, I didn't sign up to speak to address issues, but rather to present issues. Um, one, first, number one is illegal rooming houses seem to be popping up, which overcrowds communities, it overcrowds the schools. So I think that's an issue. We still have quite a few vacant properties that need to be looked into. And um, also for the December 16th bill hearings at the Sports and Learning Center, can people give their email and get copies of the bills in advance so that um, you, know, you can think about it, ponder it, and know before you get there Yes, if you would give me your email address before you leave. We have a, an email list that we send things out regularly to. So you have to be prepared to get something probably every week during the session. You'll get an email, but you'll also get the emails about this. So anybody here who would like to be added to that list, um, a lot of people here are already on that list, but if you're not on the list and you would like to be, I'll make sure there was a sign in and I'll, I'll add you. Okay, and also, as a former educator of 38 years here in Prince George's County, I'd like the council, everybody, to ensure that our children continue to receive a quality education and that no group is allocated funds over another group and that there's a balance in what we do for the children. Okay, so. Sounds good, Ms. Butler. Okay. And on the questions about the, the um, code violations, Mr. Cunningham is right over there. Raise your hand, Mr. Cunningham. Uh, I'm sure he'd be glad to uh, take your information and provide some. Thank okay, you. Okay, I see one of my former students, Brian Moe. Oh, Brian Moe was your student. When well, you get the Star of David, because I'm sure he was a hard student. <laughs> good evening. Joe Ayerson from District County Men District 2. I'm a long resident for 42 years. And my issue is the transportation, like focusing on transit, like bus and rail. The, the county bus is not, not good services because it doesn't pass 7 o'clock, it ends at 7. So, you know, I'm looking forward to the Purple Line, which is about 2020. It's only about a mile from my house, so I can take that every day when it's finished. So, so my main concern is the bus service and get some more after late service. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, thank you, and and. Daryl Mobley, our Director of Transportation, certainly is taking that uh, down. Marsha Foster, and on deck is Susan Fleshman. Flash, or Flash Foster, how are you doing? Hi, good evening. Good evening, everyone. Um, I live at 4708 68th Avenue in Highsville, Maryland, 
near the Landover Hills area, and I've been there since 1995. Um, during June 2014, I was sitting on the porch having a nice evening when a rat <laughs> pet went past my feet. Um, and I'm 67 years old. I've never had to deal with rats before. But uh, my dad, um, you know, had an exterminating job, so I have a lot of rat poison that I can use. But um, there was one house on our block, and um, they uh, got trash, I guess, from the outside, and they put it right in their backyard as if they were going to go through it. And it stayed there for a month, and, you know, nobody just didn't do anything about it because we didn't know that maybe a rat could come, be coming from there. Um, and then what happened was um, uh, I called uh, 311, my first time ever using 311. And I have to, and I wrote an email to all the politicians in the area. And um, Councilman Olson was just, uh, just tremendous. He was just excellent. And um, he even had his office uh, to um, get, he, he uh, assigned a representative to us for that area. Um, we had another problem, but the problem was with uh, bulky trash. Bulky trash, um, they don't come when they say they're going to come. So all of this trash that was in this backyard was piled up and bagged up and piled up and sat th sitting there for uh, about a month before it was picked up. Um, the uh, representative from uh, Senator Olson's office um, thought that maybe we should get in contact with um, this civic association in our area, okay, um, which is Woodlawn. Uh, I went to the meeting, Woodlawn says, well, we can't help. You know, we don't have the tools to help you out. So I went back to uh, the representative at uh, Olson's office, and she says, well, um, I says, well, maybe I could do a me I want to have a meeting to inform the community, you know, to see how bad this situation was. So I asked her if I could do it as a, a concerned citizen, and she says, no, you have to do it under an organization. So... That's where I am now. I want to have this meeting uh, with my community to maybe inform them, you know, of, of the proper procedures with uh, bulky trash and, uh, and to see if we have a rat problem. Thank you. Thank you. If I can ask you a question, ma'am, real quick. So when you called 311, what happened about the, um, the whole issue? They um, sent an inspector out. Okay. And the inspector um, inspected it, and um, since then, you know, that will all happen like in June, and I haven't seen um, that trash like that before there. So uh, the inspectors, they took care of that, okay. you know, and so forth. And, and, and um, uh, the county did a very good job helping us out, but we were just thinking that maybe we should inform, you know. The neighbors. The neighborhood, right. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Um, my name is Susan Flashman, and I've lived in Mount Rainier for over 20 years now. And there are a couple of issues that I want to bring to your attention that have been issues for me for a long time. And the first one doesn't affect you particularly. It's the county council, but since you're the executive, uh, I'm hoping that you can initiate something with the county council. And uh, I think Eric Olson did that. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Go ahead, ma'am. Okay. Uh, it's the dangerous dog issue mm -hmm. and the county's pit bull law, American pit bull law, which is a breed specific law, which outlaws an American pit bull. Terrier and Staffordshire Terriers in the county. I was fortunate enough to grandfather in my dog. My dog, I'm guessing, Wiggly died last year at 17, and I'm guessing she's the last legal dog here. 
uh, when I went to renew her tag, they no longer made the tag. So my concern is that I think the law has outlived its usefulness. I think the county needs a dangerous dog law, which is what's been endorsed across the board by animal groups. As a dog that, if a dog bites, it's considered a dangerous dog. If it doesn't bite, it doesn't get presumed to be a biter. And in that case, then you would take care of German Shepherds, Rottweilers, all of the breeds that can, any dog with teeth can attack you. And the little ones do a good job too. But I, I really think it's time for us to take a, uh, current thinking, not 17 years ago, view of this. And, and it would uh, make Prince George's County uh, off the list. There are people who will not live here because of the law uh, and who have been forced to move elsewhere because of the law. I have actually personally transported a dog out of state and out of county because of the law. Uh, and that was a uh, a dog that looks like a pit bull is not a pit bull. An American bulldog looks like a pit bull. Because, that, because of that looking like it, the county classified it as such. And as a result, I had to drive it to Kentucky to get it out of here. So I think it's time for us to reexamine that. And the second thing I would like to add quickly is that I hope that on the work construction going on, if we get the uh, FBI building, and if we get any more buildings, that there be PLAs on them. I'm a union worker, and I want to see some more union work in the county. Thank you. Up next is uh, Alyssa Polivardi and Dr. Talani Kola Kolazo. Good evening. Yeah, um, Good evening. I, my name is Elisha Puliwati, and I'm from Bellsville, 21st district, and I've been in this place for the last 20 years. Things are really moving great under your leadership. So I have seen uh, a little bit disturbance during night, especially the Fridays and Saturday night the, the, in Bellsville, where I live, uh, Lincoln Colony. Almost there is a fight almost every Friday night. I have three girls. And I called the uh, police officers, but they no respond. So I'm really concerned about this, because I have not seen these kind of things in the past 20 years. So therefore, this is my, but things are really uh, you know, good otherwise. And a little bit about the bulk uh, trash. So thank you so much. No, thank you. You said you called the police, but you didn't get a response. Uh, uh, on they, the issue, they talk to uh, talk to me, and they ask me my name and uh, what's happening. You know, it's almost they, almost they are fighting every Friday night. Mm -hmm. They fight. They were not the citizens. They don't stay in Beltsville. They came. They come from somewhere else. You know, it's next to. You know, even they were there is damage from my property, mm -hmm. and nobody takes response. And they write all bad stuff on my. You know. So it's it's not a uh, not a good uh, uh, you know kind of thing. I want somebody to look into this and you know. Okay. So that's what I want to. We can uh, make sure. Um, Thank you so much. You know, Nick, if we can have somebody talk to him. Thank you. Good evening. My Good name evening. is Tahani Goyaso, and I serve as director of schools and community engagement at Casa de Maryland. It's good to be here. Um, so I'm here to talk about community schools, and that's a model that, as you well know, emphasizes a holistic approach to educating students by meeting their education, social, physical, and emotional, and health needs, and by creating schools that are hubs of activity, not only for the students, but their parents and community members. Community schools strengthen the life of the neighborhood and ultimately ensure a stable and desirable learning and living environment for all community members. And we're talking about building on the integrated service model of the Transforming Neighborhoods Initiative. 
Um, community schools have been particularly effective at meeting student, family, and community needs across the country. And there's um, extensive research that, that um, backs that up. So we seek to um, replicate key elements of models <laughs> developed across the US. Um, and they include, those elements include out of school time programming for students. I mean, where CASA is located, so many of the children, you know, just are kind of hanging out after school and um, such a need, such a strong need for after school programming there and in other parts of the county. Um, health services and wellness programs for students and families. Family engagement and support services, academic supports for students, social and cultural enrichment, adult education and family community engagement, programs that build the capacity of adults and students to share responsibility for leadership and decision making. That's We're looking at community schools that incorporate all of these elements. And that in terms of leadership, um, there would be a lead partner, a lead partner agency that might be a a public agency or a community-based organization to help coordinate services. There would be a site-based coordinator at each school, an assessment of community resources where, you know, students, families, community and school leaders were, would all inform that process, and then a community advisory board. So we've engaged a broad range of community and labor organizations and education experts to draft community schools legislation for the state of Mar Maryland, and we look forward to talking with you more about that. Thank you, and thank you for the work that you're doing. Thank you. Next up is uh, Kirk Plunkey, and on deck is Chris Melendez. Good evening. First, thank you for uh, hosting these meetings. I think it really helps the whole thank process. You. Um, my concern is I, I live in Colmar Manor, and we're not too far away from the CSX rail lines. And there's a few uh, at, uh, um, road crossings, and federal law requires signaling, which is like four, 410 decibel horns, any time of the day, night. Uh, so I put an announcement on the listserv, and one woman was complaining over 30 years she's been waking up to this signaling problem. But there's a process to establish quiet zones, and I'm right now engaging in that. <clears throat> And it requires identification of crossings, coordination with communities, and in the end, I'm going to do a lot of homework, is there might be some costs involved. And I don't know whether it's com coming from the state or the county, but grants would help. And I know one grade crossing has the bells, the whistles, the gates, um, but there's other ones to make them more comprehensive quiet zone it may eventually require some funds so we could all live and sleep in peace thank you um, if you want if we can make sure uh, Daryl you, you heard that Daryl Mobley our director of DPW thank you thank you Hello, my name is Chris Melendez and I'm a resident of Bladensburg. And I'm here to express that uh, as a resident uh, living along the Route 1 corridor, that we would hope that the county would take um, full advantage of what is happening in, in tech development uh, within the county along the Route 1 corridor. Uh, you may be aware that in the last two weeks, the University of Maryland received its largest single donor grant of $31 million uh, to build a new computer center with the possibility of the FBI locating and all of the other security uh, industries that and tech industries that are developing within the county, as well as um, uh, affordable, we have affordable housing. Uh, we have the need for transportation along uh, the Route 1 corridor and, and uh, sustainable economic development. So I know that there is focus in uh, uh, the TNI uh, concerning our neighborhoods, but we would really ask that 
you all concentrate your focus on this particular area in development and take full advantage of that in infrastructure building for our residents related to transportation, housing, small business development, our schools for adults and children to be ready for the swiftly advancing tech developments that are happening in our county to be ready uh, for that uh, because of what's being located as well as the potential of being a commuter county to the DC area because this area is so close and uh, for the Port Towns area, it would be great if we could have adequate pu public transportation for folks that might be commuting back and forth from DC all the way up to the NSA. So the other is a focus on sustainable community family oriented businesses. Uh, and not on those that are not going to be giving back to the community, okay? And that um, parks and planning would, would adhere to the sector plans, you know, in when coming to considering uh, uh, specific site plans that are submitted by developers, okay? So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you for your testimony. Next up is Robert Adams and Jeffrey Lemieux. How's it going? My name is uh, Robert Adams. See you. And uh, you know, you had all the agencies, um, agency, agencies here, but I didn't see anybody from education. At, uh, you know, that's like the main thing in my mind, especially as we move into these new Common Core standards. It's, long story short, I don't think enough is being enough, enough is being done to bring the parents along um, in this, this whole new thing that's taking place. So I'm the uh, PTA president over at Capitol Heights. We just had our first PA, PTA meeting, and that was the main issue, you know, what's going on. You know, I don't understand this math, this, you know, this 10 ways to figure out what one plus one is, you know, that's, is it this wild? And then, you know, when you look at the, res you know, I'm starting to do my research to understand, you know, this is a problem nationwide. I don't understand how y'all decided to roll it out in, with no textbooks, you know, so it's a lot of things that I don't understand. Another thing, another issue that I had is the, the day of the water main break. My daughter's school is one of the schools that was affected. We didn't get water on that day when we were told that we were supposed to be getting water. I personally went out and got, went to the shoppers, bought water, and took it to the school. I don't understand why the PG County government couldn't get that done that day. On a statewide issue, um, something that just kind of popped in my mind today as I was sitting there thinking, I would like to see legislation on labeling of the uh, genetically mod modified foods in our state. You know, that's something that's starting. I think it's happening in California already. I know that the, some of these big companies are fighting it, but I would like to see that label, and I would like to know what I'm eating. Um, I think that's basically all I have for this evening. Thank you very much. And I don't know if he's here, but we can make sure Christian Rose from my office is um, our education liaison, and we'll make sure he gets that information. And on the legislation, uh, my colleagues to the left and right uh, were writing that down. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Jeff Lemieux from Greenbelt, longtime Greenbelt resident, and I'm on the advisory planning board there in Greenbelt, and I'm the reluctant co-chair of the new Washington Area Bicyclist Association Prince George's County Advocacy Group. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, um, very, very good. Reluctant I wanted to talk, co -chair. I wanted to talk a little a great, bit. Great event. Great, uh, great I'd organization. Like to, uh, talk a little bit about um, uh, economic development, really, uh, and transportation. The um, you know we talk a good talk now in Maryland about bike transportation, but I don't think we're really walking the walk. You know, here in northern Prince George's County, we have a phenomenally great. A uh, trail system. It extends all the way from the DC line. It's going to go through to DC soon. It extends all the way out. It's going to extend all the way out to Beltsville. Um, but it's not even mentioned in our uh, Department of Public Works transportation guide, even though hundreds of us, maybe thousand, you know, we use these trails to get to work. 
Um, so it's a transportation corridor. It takes cars off the road, um, it frees up a seat on the metro, so it should be part of this. Um, a couple other sort of concrete suggestions, you know, there's some training that we could do with the police in our area. My wife runs a bike shop here in College Park. Uh, they've had some incidents with police sort of not knowing the law too well as far as when you have, you know, you should be on the road and, and, and so on, and we've talked about that. Uh, some other concrete suggestions, you know, we have these beautiful trails, but our roads are not beautiful in this area. I mean, they're, they're gross. And you have these really wide, super wide roads, and every time a new development comes in, it seems like they add another turn lane or another lane. And what we really want, and what we've been saying in these visioning sessions and planning sessions, is you know we want trees, we want bike lanes, we want sidewalks, we want nice bus stops. Is so, there is there a particular road that you're, you could use as an example? Uh, Route one between uh, Greenbelt Road and the Beltway would be a good place to start. Route 193 between Route one and NASA. Um, those are just, you know, they're like almost miniature highways uh, and as opposed to being, you know, community roads. And what bike people need is roads that are, you know, safe to ride on, whether there's a bike lane or just a traffic calming with lower speeds. Um, and then that the highways are separate. You want to go fast, you go out on the highway. So uh, those are the kinds of things we're trying to get as streetscape improvements. Um, some other concrete suggestions, uh, it's been brought to our attention that zoning is going to be on your agenda, um, possibly to redo the zoning laws. In Greenbelt, we have a lot of empty roadways where the roads just have more capacity than we need, and we've got a lot of empty parking lots. Some of that space could be repurposed. We could put in a bike lane without slowing down traffic probably very much. We could, you know, put a soccer field where there's, you know, currently a empty parking lot behind the mall. Um, so th those sorts of things. Um, uh, police training, uh, emphasis on getting around by, by bike, as well as, you know, on foot and bus stops as part of transportation, you know, not just in a car, and uh, zoning uh, changes that can improve the streetscape. And I think that would really help economic development. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. I'm sure Daryl Mobley is standing right behind you. He's, he's, he's itching to talk to you. Okay. Um, and we'll talk to the police chief about the training. I'm sure he'll be. Next up is Robin Allen, and on deck is Darla Hines. Hello, um, my name is Robin Allen, and with me is my husband, Sean Allen, and we are uh, residents of, of Prince George's County, as well as we live on the first street into the state of Maryland, and also Prince George's County. And oftentimes we deal, because we're a borderline community, with um, issues, uh, criminal issues that flow from the district into the state of Maryland. And um, as you know, Chief Lanier has several um, tag readers, cameras in high crime areas or areas on um, in certain locations. This is a request um, so that you can hear from the citizens as we've talked to Chief McGaw that we're asking for a just a simple tag reader or license plate reader to identify if there's criminal activity or excuse me stolen vehicles that are coming into the county or leaving the county. Being right on the borderline county uh, area, um, our cars are stolen, citizens can't go to work when they come out and they recognize that their cars are stolen. We have gangs that come over to take our vehicles. I think that this could be one of the very small things that could help with crime prevention. And I understand there's rights of privacy, et cetera, but I think that we should open, have an open dialogue and at least to discuss what is the cost, what are some of the benefits. Um, secondly, um, I would like to say that I think the leaf removal um, and the lack of leaf removal has not worked in the county because we have a high multi-family um, residence that is intended for single families. So they're rental properties and the, it's the burden on the homeowner to help with the leaf removal on the street. And we have had incidents where there's wet leaves on the streets that actually can cause accidents. Okay, then secondly, um, I want to say that um, under 
crime is that we're asking for our police to purchase. They're called stadium spotlights. They're oftentimes used when there is um, crime taking place in an area or suspected drug use, um, excuse me, drug sales or transactions, illegal activities. And we had incidents that occurred they put a spotlight, I think they, um, the police borrowed it from Public Works, and they just put a spotlight there. Um, I think that our police should have this at their access to use as needed. Immediately, the cr you can imagine, right on the D.C. line, well, is the D.C. police and Maryland police. The criminals know that it's... A, um, it's the D.C. police, but they're, you know, playing the line by just putting that spotlight up there, slow that drug traffic down right away. I think the police should have that as um, to their um, disposal. Those are some things that I think will help the county is the small things that we can do to help cr cut down so that crime doesn't become big things. Do you which, have any questions? Which area of the, uh, of the county are you dealing okay. and you're talking about? Uh, right at the intersection of Sargent Road and Eastern Avenue okay. by the Catholic Archdiocese of Washington. Okay. It's really Prince George's County. Okay. Also the um, state of Maryland. Right okay. in that area, we have the Riggs Park gang that comes through. Um, and it's almost as if... Um, D.C. is regulated or it's patrolled and then you get to Maryland, voila, we don't have anything. Yeah. And um, I, I strongly suggest that we begin to even discuss, is it beneficial? How much does it cost? As, um, and I think it's just a, it's a simple thing that the police can use this data to alert them. You know what? Someone illegally is coming from North Carolina, mm. Delaware. Well. I know Barry Stanton is somewhere in the back, so I'm going to make sure that we bring that up with the police chief. Thank you. Okay. All right. And Barry Stanton's position is? Uh, he's, there he is right there. Hey, Barry, raise your hand. He's the deputy uh, county administrator for public safety. Great guy. Uh, he, he's, he's itching to talk to you. Okay. Barry, come on up. Meet people. He's hiding back there. Thank you, Barry. Yeah, well, we just brought him out the closet. Mm -hmm. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here with such luminaries in front of me, behind me, all around. I, I truly am impressed to be here, and I would like to speak on behalf of people who are not luminaries. I can say to you, I am just a teacher. I have been just a teacher my entire life. There are approximately 10,000 such in this county. We work very hard. We truly work harder than any of you probably realize. I arrived at school at 7 this morning. You will note that I am still here and mostly, you know, ambulatory. <laughs> uh, there was an article in yesterday's Washington Post which had a number of omissions, obfuscations, and the like that I would like to make clear. I know for a fact that you, Mr. Baker, and Ms. Ivy are definitely friends of education, and I, you've all visited the PGCEA. Okay. At our last meeting, I delivered a petition which was signed by every teacher at Northwestern High School. It was signed by the vast majority of people at the PGCEA Center. The only reason that all of them didn't sign it was I was unable to get there any earlier than that. Can you guess which issue I have in mind? Well, I'll help you. You don't even have to guess. I don't want to embarrass anyone. During all my years, okay, technologically, Prince George's County has moved steadily forward until this summer. We came back, our printers are gone. Not a big deal? No? You're not feeling my pain? Let me try this. Okay. Nine copier machines in the entire school here. We have approximately 100 and 
60 teachers. So every 19 and a half, I'm sorry to call somebody a half a teacher, they're there without it. What do we use these things for? We print lesson plans. We're asked to individualize things. How can we do that? I mean, we're not supermen. Okay, to walk down there to any place, it will take three minutes to get there. Lead time, the minimum amount of time you will spend in any time there is 10 minutes. 10 minutes, by the way, there are other 20 teachers geared up and you'd better move it. And okay, most of the time, we did not use the, the printers in our classroom for copies as Mr. Watts sort of disingenuously suggested. We used those to get the original material so we would take only a very small percentage of the time so that we could get on to the business of teaching your children the most priceless possession any of you have. You want the job done well, give us the tools to give it. Give us back our printers. Okay. Delegate Ivy said that seems reasonable to her. So we will talk to the superintendent about the printers. Oh, I'm sorry. May I have one thing? Two Please. Schools, two schools in the county have all of their printers. Can you guess which? That's right. Roosevelt and Oxen Hill. Both of them. No. Okay. <laughs> Up next is oh. uh, Kathy Galher. And Thank on you, deck, Sheila. On deck is Melinda Moore. Hi, good evening. My name is Kathy Gallagher. I am a lifelong PG County resident, product of the school system. And I currently live in Riverdale Park, and I'm actually part of a parish in Langley Park. And tonight, I'm here because I'm part of a group called United for the Common Good, which is a faith-based organization that's especially concerned about the needs of the economically vulnerable, particularly in our county. So. We are super excited about the Purple Line coming through the Purple Line corridor because it provides such needed transportation options for a lot of low-income folks, but we're extremely concerned about displacement. Um, currently, our goal is to really attend to the needs of people who often are not going to show up at meetings like this, who live from paycheck to paycheck and then not even very successfully. For them, this tra new transit is going to be a godsend, but not if they can't afford to stay there. So I'm speaking tonight to just really encourage us to keep as a core value the preservation of culturally and economically diverse county, to so really make it a livable county for people with a lot of money and people with a little money and to um, put in a special word for low-income housing, because I know affordable housing is a great buzzword, but I think we also need to name plainly that there are people who make very little, who work extremely hard, and they need quality housing options. I want to thank you publicly because you have given some support to the Purple Line Compact being developed, which is a, a concrete tool that's going to help us get there. We gathered over a thousand signatures that we sent to you and others who are making these decisions, and we're really excited to be part of the people at the table. But you have a louder voice than I do, so I am asking you to use it. And I'd like to take a minute to share just a couple of little vignettes. The parish I worship at is in Langley Park. It's mostly recent immigrants, Catholic community of Langley Park. And I work with the youth there. First generation, bright and beautiful kids, but as you know, at risk. In Langley Park, easily, I think only 40% of kids graduate from high school in five years. And if these kids are moved out from place to place two or three times during their high school years, they become less and less capable of forming stable communities. I've watched so many lovely kids, like with a couple of bad decisions, either end up with children at a very young age or into drugs or just get derailed because there are so many difficult paths that surround them. So I want us to be a force for keeping their community stable. And also to say that that Catholic community of Langley Park is there only because there are so many folks living in that apartment. If people get displaced because of income, um, we're going to lose English classes, computer classes, we're going to lose a food pantry, and some very positive forces in the community. So I know you're already um, in support of this, and I also want to thank publicly CASA of Maryland for their fantastic work trying to raise this issue, but I hope you'll continue to work in that direction. Thanks. Yes, we will. Thank you very much. And I should say that uh, Sheila Jackson is here from the, from the school system. 
So uh, we'll be directing Sheila. Let's give Sheila a round of applause. Yes, ma'am. Hello, my name is Melinda Moore, and I'm a resident of University Park. I want to first of all say thank you for the support that you have given for the schools and the education in our county. Um, I have uh, a basic question um, uh, regarding education. How do you see the new school board and structure and leadership making improvements with regards to the county's TAG program, specifically TAG in the regular classroom? I have two TAG-identified children who have grown up in PG County Public Schools. Um, they went to University Park Elementary School, then Hyattsville Middle School, and are now at Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, although they've had some great teachers um, throughout their education um, who integrated some of the TAG concepts into their teaching, I have seen no corporate implementation of TAG in the regular uh, classroom concepts to include enrichment clustering, curriculum compacting, tiered assignments, independent study, um, some of the various concepts that the TAG, the county actually uh, embraces. Uh, over the past years, I've seen great improvements with building up our TAG schools, separate schools, um, but not, once again, the TRC program. Rather, I continue to see the TRC programs implemented at the complete discretion of the principals and the teachers, um, some of whom are resistant to the county's TRC recommendations or lack the proper training and materials to implement those concepts. Uh, as the previous speaker spoke about the benefits of community schools, um, completely agree, um, but I believe the focus on these separate TAG schools has actually detracted from um, the focus on the TRCs within our community schools, building those, those community schools up. I personally have seen um, friend after friend, um, unfortunately, move their children into private schools or out of the county completely because their children's needs are not being met. So I hope that the current school board and leadership will reinstate a focus on the tag in the regular classroom, um, requiring standards and hold the community schools um, accountable for meeting tag requirements for the children so they can remain in their community schools. Thank you. I, I can sure. tell you that we're working with the school system as part of the issues that we're bringing up. And it'd be great if we can, I saw you reading from your testimony, if, if it's possible for us to get a copy of that, that'd be great. It's scribble scratch. Well, so I can email. I got Christian great. Rhodes' um, email. There and you I can go. follow up with him. Yeah, because part of what we're doing with the uh, Dr. Maxwell and with the um, Dr. Uh, Sego Newbanks and Christian's, our education liaison, is really just coming together as a as a government as a whole to, to, to deal with issues of education in here and, and Delegate Ivy and I were talking about, uh, we both had, I had one child that was in the TAG program, I don't know how many, you had, she had five. <laughs> so I had to deal with the busing issue of the child out of our neighborhood to, uh, to the TAG program, uh, you know, just once, she had to deal with it several times. So we understand that, so we'd love to uh, get the notes, if you can email the Christian, we certainly will bring that up. Okay, and great. I'll make sure Ms. Jackson has a copy. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before I call the next person, just want to remind everybody um, in the back, although the conversation that is taking place with some of our department heads is great, uh, try to keep the conversation a little lower uh, because it, it is caring up front. It makes it a little tough to hear. Uh, the next person up is Sybil Brown, and on deck is Jeff Clark. Hi, good evening. Um, my name is Sybil Brown. I live in Cottage City. I'm a caregiver for my mother. Oh. I'm a veteran. I quit my job from the federal government uh, two and a half years ago to take care of her. She was in North Carolina, but in the assistant living, the care that, or lack of care that she received uh, made me quit my job. But I just attended a uh, caregiver conference given uh, last week, uh, and 43 million uh, caregivers there out there, and 49, uh, age 49 and above, and even uh, a third of those are caring for their grandkids, 18. So I'm trying to see if any way we can get additional resources available uh, I had called a couple of months ago for a respite. They were out of money, but the physical year is here now. But uh, with the, all the money being made at the casinos, anyway, PG County can uh, tap into some of that and 
send it our way. And also, uh, Miss Ad- Grant didn't send you up here to testify, uh, did she? No, no, she did not. <laughs> um, aging in place, of course, is better for uh, our seniors to reside at their residence as long as possible. But is there any way we can get additional funding? Uh, the ones that are trying to live independently, they're not able to afford to get the help they need to keep the house up to date and you know get the, the help that they need without having to go into a home. And also with the uh, grandparents, the grand foster parents that are taking care of our young people, is there any kind of way we can get additional funding for them? Like once school is out, <clears throat> Of course, you know uh, some of the people uh, get their nutritional meals while school is while they're at school. Any kind of program we can implement. I uh, know summer camps are very expensive for families that have, you know, two or three kids at $100 per child. That's not affordable. So anything we can do to help our youth and help our seniors, I appreciate it, sir. Thank you very much, and thank you for the uh, work you're doing. And, and certainly, uh, I know Miss uh, Miss Grant and Miss Brown um, are kindred spirits, and um, and Miss Francis, if she was here, she would uh, be the same. So we will look into that. Thank you, sir. Mm. Hello. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. My name is Jeffrey Clark. I live in Brentwood, Maryland. Uh, I have a concern about some of the uh, issues with the county webpage. And it's something I've been thinking about for several years. Um, the boards and commissions page has uh, many uh, boards where you would go to that lot row and you click on it, and it brings you to uh, all the information about that board or commission. It would have uh, all the members. Like one example um, might be the um, uh, redevelopment authority. So you would be able to see uh, all the members and their schedule, their agendas, their minutes, and so forth, and, and then all of what their program is, uh, entails. Um, and then the other um, group that uh, Peter Shapiro had uh, chaired, that uh, was another good example of a, a way a board and commission could uh, be fully transparent. So what I'm hoping is that you could have all of the boards and commissions each uh, be uh, set up in that way so that you would see an aging uh, group or whatever it is and you could click on it and then many of the people here might want to participate in, in what these groups do or even be appointed um, but if it's just one line and it's not a link to a page that describes all of what it does, the, their meeting schedules, their uh, minutes and their agendas and so forth um, and, you know, even the terms, if you see that somebody's term has expired, maybe some, many of the people here might be interested in being uh, appointed to uh, those various boards and commissions. So that would be a way, I guess, with your IT department working with all those groups to, to gather all that information. You could also add um, their charter uh, as well as the county uh, law that created that particular uh, group. So that I think would, would help and then, you know, with that, you might even uh, enhance the uh, review the description of the uh, appointment process uh, for all those different uh, appointed um, you know uh, commissions uh, the last uh, thing I had was to uh, talk about the police department um, the the dispatch line the three five two twelve hundred is one that many of the municipalities use, and we encourage people to uh, to call there if it's not an emergency but if somebody calls there and then they get frustrated if there's no pickup. So if that could be changed to like after 10 rings, go to a voicemail and encourage them to call back or be able to leave a message, then that would make that county uh, dispatch line uh, much more uh, usable. Uh, but also to maybe switch the uh, home, uh, home invasion or home break-in uh, category to not be in the 911 don't uh, section. Uh, so that could help for, you know, just so the people would know when they can, you know, call 911 or call the, the dispatch line. So thank you. Thank you. And we'll look into those. And, and Barry will look into the, um, Brian, if you could talk to him about the dispatch, and Barry will look into the uh, uh, great suggestions on the, uh, on the, on the webpage. 
Uh, our last two speakers, um, Virginia Lockmuller, and on deck is Ruby Burke. Hi, my name's Virginia Lockmuller. Um, my husband and I, almost 30 years ago, got stuck in Prince George's County. Um, since I'm probably going to die there, uh, or will probably die there, <laughs> uh, I decided that I would take on some of the issues. Um, we get traffic from DC, Maryland, and Virginia, and s significant traffic. And the only thing, the only business that we can bring into Bladensburg are 7-Elevens. In fact, they w built a 7-Eleven uh, right down the street from the high school so that it would be a convenience for all the 70% uh, truants that could hang out there. Um, I, uh, uh, any pride, that, I mean, we've never been able to educate our son in Prince George's County. We've always had to go to the expense of private schools. Um, and uh, any, any pride that we had in the new home that we, built, that we bought in Bladensburg uh, quickly turned into an embarrassment about the fact that people won't even come into the area with the Walmart that we have there. It's, it's a joke. It's a mess. It looks like a cesspool. I don't know if it's in Bladensburg because every other street has a different town name. Um, we need beautification efforts. And um, we, we have slabs of concrete in between our highway where they could put beautiful um, potted plants like they do in Potomac and in Montgomery County. Um, most people complain that uh, small businesses are forced out with Walmart, but they haven't seemed to be able to force the small businesses out of our neighborhood. Um, anyway, uh, wonderful things are being done by in, to some of the ugliest areas in D.C. Um, southeast, uh, you know, to some of the ugliest areas. So I was wondering if maybe you could talk to Marion Barry or Mayor Gray. They probably are in need of a job right now. Um, they might be looking soon. So maybe you could talk to them and ask them if they could come into our neighborhood and bring some development into Bladensburg. Thank you very much. Well, You'll be, you'll be pleased to know that we took one step further. So we went and got the guy who had, um, who had helped him, uh, who had helped him uh, do all that development in D.C. Uh, Victor Hodgson, could you raise your hand? So he was the deputy mayor for economic development. So this young lady would like us to do the same. So we, we went and stole him. We took your, we were mind reading. But, we got but you. They're not, but they go, they go to every other area but Bladensburg. Bladensburg is a forgotten town. Not anymore. You just put it back on the right. map. Bladensburg, Victor, I'll, be, I'll see you there, man. He's going to see you there. See you there. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for allowing me to speak. My name is Ruby Burke. I live in the Lewisdale area. On April 30th, WSSC opened seven floodgates, and it, I, in the Lewisdale area in Hyattsville, I called WSSC and they told me there's no way that the water got to my area. Well, me and my neighbors, we had minimum of five feet of water in my basement, which wiped out my entire basement. And yes, I do have flood insurance, but flood insurance covers tearing down the walls and putting them back up. It does not cover doors. You promote purchasing a home in PG County, taking care of the elderly. Well, and I take care of my 83-year-old father and in order for him to stay with me and my children, the basement is an apartment and that was mine and everything I owned was gone. I've been calling, no one seems to be able to tell me why this water came and WSSC, as I said, said it wasn't their fault. They opened these seven floodgates and there's no way that the water reached from Laurel to Hyattsville on that same day, April 30th of this year. There's also drainage. There's one drain for all of the houses in my area. The next drain is three blocks away. So there was nowhere for this water to go except into our homes. 
410 backs my home. There's debris. They came and cut the trees down, but they left it in the drainage system, so my backyard was a swimming pool. There was so much water, and there was so much water that it knocked my back door down. Not just my home, all of the homes in my area. We don't know who to call because everyone's saying that it's not on them, it's not their fault, they don't know, and that there's no way that this water came this far, and it did. Did, did WSSE actually come out to your house and look at it, or the area? No. They told me to prove it was them. I did file a claim, and they told me to prove it. Right. That well, it was me, I'm going to direct you, ma'am, to uh, Larry Kaufman over, our deputy director for DER. I'd be okay. glad to um, to help. Okay, thank, thank you. you. With that, I want to thank everyone for coming out. Thank you so much. Ms. Williams, I'd like to see you. And as you're leaving, don't forget, you can get up and leave, but just to remind you that, again, there will be another session on Thursday, October 9th at Oxon Hill High School, also starting at 6 o'clock with an open house and 7 o'clock for the actual listening session. And then on October 16th uh, will be Central County, Thursday, October 16th at Charles Flowers High School. Thank you very much for coming out. Enjoy the rest of your evening and travel home safely. <laughs>